You're ready? Yeah. Okay. Good Welcome to the City of Klamath Falls, Monday, April 5th, 2021. Our work session is 6.30, where we'll be discussing the outside agency funding process, um, information, outside agency funding process. And we have um, Eric Osterberg reporting. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm pleased to be before you tonight to give you an update about our outside agency funding process. Uh, this, pro this presentation tonight is going to be kind of two parts. The first part is just going to be going over the process that staff created to try and better funnel these requests to you. And then the second half of the presentation is going to be going over the respondents who submitted applications to us. All right. So there's kind of three things that we wanted to accomplish with this process. The first one is fiscal stewardship, just an increase in the accountability of allocating public dollars. Second, uh, equity, or in the sense of fairness. Uh, we are evaluating all of the community partners now by the same standard. We're asking the same information, and we're, they're all on the same time frame, which provides consistency, predictability, and some structure uh, to that process. And then third, um, informed decision making. It's our hope that this will strengthen councils communication about the priorities, then also that you're getting, you're being given a bevy of information to better decide where funding should be allocated uh, in partner with community uh, organizations. So this is the first year of our process. We were developing the process at the same time that we were implementing the process this first year. So it was a little bit like building the plan as you're flying it. Uh, we were getting feedback, uh, kind of live feedback from all of our community partners, people who you've decided to, in the past have decided to fund um, about the process. So it kind of morphed, morphed a little bit as we were implementing it. Uh, moving on. So there's kind of two things, two considerations that we baked into kind of the process we'll be going over tonight. Uh, the first is the level of funding. Level of funding in the sense of the amount of the requests that organizations are requesting of the city. And then second, the time frame, which is driven by the budget. Just how do we better align these funding requests to our budget process, given that it's a biannual budget process. Um, so kind of the line of demarcation that Christina May Mooring and myself came to, um, this was from a survey of other communities who have similar processes, is uh, the amount of $2,500. So it's a pretty simple flow chart. So if a request is greater than $2,500, it goes through the on-cycle funding process, which is aligned with the budget, the biennial budget process. And the off-cycle funding process for requests of $2,500 or less, which is just any time of the year they can approach council through the city manager to make that request. So going into depth, in greater depth into each of these processes, so I'm gonna go start on the left side, which is the on-cycle funding process. This is aligned with the bu uh, biennial budget. The, this is, um, we're capturing requests of $2,500 or more. Uh, it is funded on an agency basis, meaning that we are, we're expecting that the, the people who are requesting uh, money from this tranche of funding are going to be nonprofit or economic development corporations, organizations like that. Um, and the, uh, the application is going to be comprehensive. So some of the things that we asked for um, from the first round of funding for the on-cycle funding, we've asked for organizational charge, information about the board of directors, um, a, a overview of the financial status of the organization, a narrative of the organization. We're, we're asking for kind of in the weeds information because um, we're more because because of the amount of funding. Um, so the eligible kinds of services and programs and activities that can be funded under this tranche of funding is your typical business attraction and retention, small business assistance, workforce development, and affordable housing, etc. On the other side, the off-cycle funding. This is requests that are twenty-five hundred dollars or less year-round, uh, funded on a per-project basis, so it could be a community group, it could just be a group of community citizens coming together spontaneously saying, hey, we'd like a request for this event, this parade, what have you, and the application is much more basic. Uh, I have it before me today, um, the, just in comparison, the on-cycle funding uh, application is about six pages, the off-cycle funding uh, application is just one page front and back. And for the off-cycle funding, we're asking for just basic narrative information. Essentially, just kind of tell us what you're needing from the council. Kim, yeah. do you want to ask Yeah, absolutely. Do you see the, is the off-cycle funding, uh, would an organization be able to request like once a year, and then once they request it, then it's done? Then they have to wait another year before oh, they have it again? Oh. <laughs> or what, what, what is your vision there? Um, I didn't actually anticipate that, but that's a great idea. That's something that we might consider. 
um, allowing only one time request. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But that have we ever, uh, have we ever really had? I'm not sure it's happened, right? But we don't very often have somebody come twice in a fiscal year, do we? Uh, no, this not, is really it's trying to find putting a rule in place. But, it's, but we, we, we've had the Roth Ragland come in front of us twice in one year. And that's true. That's probably the only one. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and, and blue zones probably could do that. But those would all be bigger than 20. You, well, uh, now, yeah, I mean, like what the old, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it, no, it's not. Wrong. There will be opportunity. We'll have to probably make some changes as we go forward because we are learning through this first cycle. And we do have some questions after this to, to ask you and get your input. Yeah, so um, now I'm kind of going on the steps, uh, the steps of each process. So on cycle funding process, this is what we're proposing. Um, the RFP is announced the first week of every other January at the beginning of the biennial, or the year the biennial will start, excuse me. The RFP is open for two weeks, and then it will close. Um, the next step is staff recommends responsive application to council. I want to just pause right here and kind of explain what I mean by that. A responsive application would be an application that provides all of the information we're requesting. Um, staff would, in the event that uh, an applicant doesn't provide all the information, we would reach back out to the organization and say, hey, this information is required, can you get it back to us? We would work with it, it's not going to be a hard deadline. Um, but we just want to make sure that you have the same amount of information from all of the responding applicants, or all of the interested parties. Uh, next, uh, Budget Committee and City Council will determine funding after a presentation from the applicant. This would be and I don't know that you're going to do that. You've never done that before. Uh, we talked about this. Yeah. I thought you were going to remove that section. Okay. Uh, you, you've not let them come and speak. You could, but it's really up to you. We, we should, we'll talk as you get to the end. There are some unintended consequences when you go down this road, and we talked about that when we created the policy. And then uh, lastly, in off year, so the year, the second half of the biennium, council would, uh, the idea would be that these organizations would report back to council, give an update about how the funding's been used so far, are they meeting the goals that you agreed to, and then council would decide to fund for that second year, the second half of the biennium. Um, moving on. What's your Eric on that one? Um, I, I understand the, the process for the city mm -hmm. to want to do this every other year personally I think I would rather be more flexible or, or rather have it every year like I, I feel like if we're doing every other year we're setting up which we have a few entities right that we fund every year but I feel like this would incentivize or force more into us being their crutch right like now when they put a, a application in, they're putting it in for two years, right? Like they're not working on one project or one event or have a great idea and want to see how to, you know, or need help get it executed. Now we're just getting into, well, money from the city is part of our operating budget. We need that to exist. Mm. Uh, and, and I know we're doing that for our budget. That makes sense to me for us, right? But I don't know if that's great for the users of... Yeah, and, and I think you could do it however you want. We would, at the time of budget, probably budget both sides of it if you were choosing to do it, but then you could decide that next January to do it again and not, you could use that same amount of money, just not fund the same groups if you did. Right. I, I think that's what I'd rather see is that we have applications every year. Every year. Okay. So that we can get a new round, right? Someone can have a brilliant idea in August and they don't have to wait 18 months <laughs> to see if we're going to help out with it. I see both sides, but I mean, I, I think there's value in it. I see both sides, but I see there's value in what you're doing. Saying, I also think um, there's certain organizations who may want to do a longer commitment to because their because their goals are longer in commitment. Yeah, I think we have. Yeah, and I think we have. I mean, we know who those are yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, and they're, I mean, they're probably psyched they don't have to do it every two years, right? Yeah, I, I just wouldn't be hung up on it. Per, personally, yeah. I wouldn't be hung up on it, but there might be some situations that you may want to go, you might want to do a five-year commitment. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, this process is flexible as it's in development, so we're definitely open to changing it so it's annual. Council uh, I, so, can I, sorry, I, I'm going to in my two cents on that too. I like the flexibility of ha having an annual RFP process. So 
so that you have um, different people that different projects like Councillor Dodson said, um, but also so that it's not on a two-year basis and an operating budget for some, some of these entities. Whether or not there may be entities, like you said, that we would enter into a longer contract with, but I think this gives the city a little more flexibility. I see. So one of the um, trying to just think of solutions off the top, maybe something we could do is that we could build it into the process that if council wants to fund uh, organization for multi-year, that's just kind of decided at the time that you're sitting down talking with them, or maybe they present to you. Yeah, I think I think uh, we can work all this as we go. Yeah. I think there there we we funded a few in a longer term. Most we've done year to year, even our even our development groups, right? Uh, because you've wanted report return a report to what they've been doing. Uh, sometimes that is a problem with a multi-year. Uh, we did multi-year with Blue Zones. Uh, we did a multi-year agreement with uh, Ross Raglan. Uh, that, that ended up being more of a sponsorship. You bought, you yeah. know, did multiple years sponsorship. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of flexibility. What I'm hearing is what we would do is budget a like amount and then you all can decide. And, and if you want to go a little bit longer with a group, you could do that if you wanted to have them come back and make the sales pitch again, then that would be up to it. Yeah. We, can, we can discuss that as, we're, as you're awarding, because we do all these by contract now. So as they're coming in front of you to be awarded, you could decide if, you know, if we present a two year and you want it to be one year, then make it one year. Okay. It'll be council's mm -hmm. purview at that time. All right, now I'm kind of just going over the off cycle funding process. The idea would be anything less than $2,500 once more. Um, the applicant submits the community funding form, that's called the community initiative form. Um, staff reviews for responsive applications. The staff submits it to the city manager, city manager Nathan, uh, then throws it on the agenda, and then you're speaking directly to the community group who's making that funding request any time during the year as opposed to just at the beginning. Is the thought. Uh, so now this is going to put, kind of shift a little bit over to Nathan. Nathan has a lot better uh, historical knowledge of uh, some of these organizations that went in history a year. Um, but we wanted to present to you tonight all of the respondents from this first, the first year of this process. Um, on the left, you'll have, you know, Klamath Idea, SCOA, KFDA, KCA, YMCA, and the Klamath Gospel Mission. What I'd like to point out is that there's asterisks behind two of these names. Uh, these are individuals who did not provide us with the specific amount of funding that they are requesting. We can kind of only kind of guesstimate what they need. Um, Klamath Greenways would seem to want up, you know, the, the total amount, the 2,500, but Klamath Falls Gospel Mission is kind of up in the air, not clear. There was no numbers in what they submitted to us. And I, I think we talked that um, some of these may not have uh, submitted all the required information. Um, uh, specifically, I think there were some, maybe some shortfalls in YMCA's. It was a YMCA and claim that Falls Gospel Mission did not provide everything that we could ask for, but I wanted to bring it before you today still so you just had an idea of who, who responded. And so, uh, one of the things to, to we have to keep in mind as, as council, and we'll, we'll reiterate this with the Budget Committee, uh, our charter is our governing document. And the charter, Section 48, requires that the city fund essential services mm -hmm. before they fund anything else. Uh, the history of that, it was passed in the 70s, late 70s actually, and uh, the city council at that time and, and, and the citizen committee who, who pushed the charter amendment felt that the city was becoming the, the funder of a lot of nonprofit groups, and they didn't like that. They felt like there were things the city wasn't doing because they were, and it specifically was the senior center at that time. Um, just reading through the minutes of the meetings and it, was, it looked like it was fairly contentious. So they passed this resolution, uh, or they passed that, the citizens voted on that charter. So each budget, when we talk about the charter, we say, yes, we've, we believe we have funded all those essential and we have some money to do economic development and other things. So we do have to be careful when we're doing funding that we, that we acknowledge that. Uh, the other so in, in a year, in theory, in a year where you, you turned around the budget committee said, you need to lay people off, and if they list certain essential departments, you probably cannot legally fund other agencies, right? Because you just, you made a determination, you don't have funds to do your essential services. So we haven't had that for a long time, but I just like to keep that 
in everybody's forefront. Uh, and then the, the other is always that law of unintended consequences. If you fund one, then you become the funding, because we have a lot of groups that do similar things. So just something for council to be aware of, uh, especially with uh, the economy being kind of, uh, well, uncertain at the moment. I do think it's something we'll have to, to monitor as we go forward. But it, uh, I think it was before the year before I got here, I think you uh, directed staff to cut, and they cut three positions that were in, in where the charter lists. In those years, I think it would be very difficult to, with a straight face, make an argument that you funded your essential services. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't cut there, uh, but I think we would just have to be careful how we worded that. When it comes to the budget committee, you think you're spending too much, you need to cut this. That's different, I think, than a structured conversation that takes place over six months and say, we're gonna go a different direction. So that, that would be my only caution. Good. Yeah. Um, so no. maybe I'm too early on this, but uh, on cycle funding, I was, I'm just looking at these. So the Klamath Falls Downtown Association, they, isn't that a little different because they provide services actually, I mean, they actually do services for the city, not so much as a, where Casita, and I'm not saying, I'm not belittling Casita on this or anything like that, Casita is more of a marketing philosophy and we want to be part of economic growth here, but it's not a, a defined, you will do this, 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 where Downtown Association is defined Part of your contract is you are doing this and this and this and this. Correct. Aren't those two different, though? Why would why should Klamath Falls Downtown Association really be part of this? I guess so so KFDA has two portions of their funding. Uh, the fifty thousand you see here, they get about seventy two thousand. It's that other uh, twenty two thousand that are very specific to specific tasks. The fifty thousand covers general items. Uh, which could be, neither, neither of those, uh, KC either nor the downtown are listed as essential services. So. Right. Uh, but yeah, we shifted that a few years back when we started funding KC to, or K, uh, Cloud Falls and, and KC in a different fashion. Uh, they have specific tasks they're, do, they're supposed to do for us and then we report back. It is a little different. So that's, you only see the 50,000 here. It's actually a 72, but some of that are, are very specific in other Funding okay. pots. Yeah, so you, like you're pulling up to is the the downtown light post and the hanging baskets. Right. And flower work. Right. That comes from our EID. Uh, so that's uh, that's not part of this money, this funding. It was part. It's part of the ask, but that part is covered because it's covered by the debt. Different. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And that, and, and quite honestly, that's where I was going with some of these organizations. <clears throat> so if I'm organization X and I'm asked to hire staff or I'm asked to I would be hard to hire staff every year you know because not know well I got a job for you this year but I'm not sure next year so that's where I would think a three or four year contract five year contract to establish you know staff so you need it you had a secure funding source that's all that's where I was coming from. I, I think they would uh, say that that would be something they would prefer. Right? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then just kind of the what did we learn this first year? The first thing is to specifically ask for cost. We mentioned at the beginning of the both applications, uh, but as we saw, kind of false gospel mission and kind of greenways didn't provide the cost breakdown. We just need to be more explicit about that. And then the other point of, uh, the biggest point of feedback this year was we had, had initially asked for financial statements from these organizations, and there was a lot of hesitancy for us to, to be, for them to share it with us. They were concerned about trade secrets, that kind of thing being leaked out. Um, so instead, we're going to be asking for just budget overviews from these organizations. Um, so, so there's one other similar item. Uh, we've received several requests this year uh, to be part of it. They wanted to be part of the next budget to help acquire different pieces of property. Uh, so they don't really fit, they didn't fit under this process and frankly some of those are quite large asks. And so I'm, I'm 
curious how to, to move forward with that. My thought was um, to bring it up to the budget committee when we're there, but I probably will not budget them at those levels. I, so, so to keep it in perspective, um, Link River Estates, it's a million and a half dollars to acquire that property. The group has asked us to come up with a share. Uh, we could, if you want to put a certain amount in there for that, um, but I don't think it's worth a million and a half, and so I'm not sure how to, how to do that. At the same time, we received a request from uh, one of the conservancy groups. They would like us to acquire the parcel uh, known as the barley fields. It's the industrial piece across the lake that's flooded all the time. Uh, that's $275,000 ask. So again, a, a large one, and I was recently approached, uh, and we may have a work session on this. Somebody wants us to acquire the two two of the parcels in phase one of Timberville Shores to put more public green space in there. So that's probably about 1.4 million, based on what the what the current property owners are asking just for the property. So I, I'm, I'm torn a little bit on how to how to put those in a budget that's already. Um, well, it's not flush, right? So you'd have to decide there are other priorities and things you've talked about. So I'm looking for a little direction. If you want to have a work session specifically on that, we'd have to do it. Um, we probably squeeze in, uh, I think, at our next meeting. I'm trying to remember what we have on the next meeting, but. Um, the 19th. Yeah. The 19th. What, what's on the 19th? Um, do you recall? You would ask. I don't. <laughs> on the 19th. Mm. Sorry, I know there's something, but it's yeah. not. It's just, we have work sessions all the time. So it would be after that. If that's something you want to do, we can try and put that in. It's just, it's there, there are asks that have been coming to me, and I'm not 100% sure how to how to build them in into the budget. The budget, our, our revenues are down in some areas, strong in others. Uh, and so we're still in that process of building it. Uh, I don't, you couldn't do all of those. There's no way you could do that. Um, and, and you have to then weigh, are those your highest priorities if you're going to spend that kind of money or would you rather do something else? So, so those, are, those are those pieces that I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with. I don't want to just put them in the budget and then have them kick it out because it requires, it's a lot of work when the budget committee kicks something out. It's a lot of work when you add it too, but I'm just trying to figure out how to uh, how best handle those requests. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, yeah, it sounds like we probably better have a work session on yeah. where you have specifics, right? Not not just the general concept of should we buy vacant land for the public benefit, right? I mean, if, there's obviously a, an end game with all three of those um, that we can decide on the merits of those different end games. I mean, because I think they're all very different. <laughs> yeah, and then my concern always, I think, so an example of that, okay, it's not just the cost of buying, purchasing, and developing the property through the park, but then it's the next 25 years of maintaining the park. And, well, and you know, and pulling off the right tax rolls. Yeah, for all that. For any better. higher, better use. Okay, there you go too. Maybe not with the, the swamp land, or not the swamp land, the flooded land. <laughs> right, right. But, but the other two are viable economic <laughs> And some of these, some of these, uh, you, you would think that you would want the committee, you know, we have a parks and rec committee, would they, shouldn't we be getting advice from them of, of if this is the best use and best, are we keep maintaining all of our parks right now? Should we be taking on an additional park? I don't know. So there's a lot of unanswered yeah. questions that I think. Well, I think a work session we can ask those questions yeah. and not have the answers, right? But yeah. that will help flush out. Okay. Uh, wheels, I, I cannot remember what's on the next one, but we'll figure out how to squeeze. In there. Mm -hmm. can, can we go back and talk about a presentation, a funding presentation from the applicants? Yeah, is that something you are interested in? Technically, it would have to happen in front of your budget committee. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it's interesting to see those, but it also can add hours and hours of time, mm -hmm. especially if, I mean, pulling off the cuff, right? But if SCOAD, Downtown, and Casita all presented, we probably already know 90% of what they're gonna say. Um, so I, I, I do think it's interesting for that every now and then. 
Um, you can just retain it as an option. Yeah, oh, like I said, I, I'm either way. I, I've been on groups where they have to come in and present, and you learn a lot. Um, but then after a few years, you're like, you already, well, a lot of them are pretty static. <laughs> so then you just burn through a half hour during a budget committee, right? Just on one group, and you have four or five of them. Um, Good. You, you're supposed to be getting, so KC has done it. Um, we can have those groups that you fund come in and give you uh, regular updates. updates. Uh, typically, they send us a written update, but uh, that's not always really exciting to read. So if you'd like uh, in person, well, I know KC has done it recently, uh, but some of the other groups. Well, maybe it's a good idea, right? If it's a new one, right? If it's someone we're looking that's mm -hmm. asking for funding for a first time, as they give a presentation, and we can kind of balance that versus our known entities. And then after we've done it once, and we they can come give a report at some point. I don't know. I'm assuming we give them a time limit. Yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah. That, uh, I I almost prefer that that they give us a presentation, and then if we have questions, we invite them to answer the questions. I I yeah. almost prefer it that way, um, but. I mean, just give people maybe just five minutes at the budget hearing. What can they? They should be able to accomplish. Or, or could they give us a written proposal and we can go through those and well, then we can pick the ones we want well, and then that, say, yeah, that was the one before. Yeah, that was just written. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. the application process, you already have a written proposal. Right. Right. Uh, but I just was thinking that council may want the opportunity to ask questions and interact. On yeah, I think that's well. that's good. Um, I mean, and I. I guess being at budget committees where nobody showed up but was asking for lots of money, that's frustrating too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe we do say come prepared with a, I mean, a brief five minute cap presentation and then we can ask questions if we want. But that's only going to add, you know, a half hour to our meetings instead of two hours. Yeah. And I think it would be really nice to know what the, what the total budget that we're working with is so that we could, we could know. It's it's or up to it it's up to it's us. kind of up to you. I will say that um, if we just go with what we've traditionally funded, where are we at? Where is that? Uh, you have traditionally. I won't say traditionally. You have funded in the past Klamath Idea, um, SCOED, KFDA, and KCDA at amounts point. similar to that. To that. Um, if you were to add another group in that at, at that range, we have never budgeted. Some of those monies come out of the economic development fund, but the economic development fund is solely funded by transfers in from the general fund. So it really is general fund money. We just put money in there periodically. We have taken some of the uh, affluent money sometimes and put it in there from Cogen, but but essentially there is no funding source for the economic development funds. Just how we track. The expenditures. Um, so, if if you wanted to give us a number to shoot for, this is what they've requested. It doesn't mean you have to fund them at that level. I just think the opportunity for new people to come in, and um, so there's a Midge Festival that wants to happen, and they're going to be uh, hopefully they put something in. But those are new economic drivers that we could support and see where that goes, you know, with the um, off-cycle funding if it was less, you know. So, so you do have money in the off-cycle. Let me correct myself on that one. So uh, we have, in the past, uh, you, for as far back as I can see, you have helped fund the 4th of July Festival. So that's just been in your budget. Mm -hmm. um, Several years back, we committed to being funders for the Cla Catalyzed Klamath, so that's been in there. But then we put in an, an additional, I believe it was uh, six or eight thousand dollars for you to do sponsorships throughout the year. So that's where I would see some of this off cycle funding. Uh, the idea being, what we probably should do is say, if you want it, you need to come out at the same time because you get hit with great ideas. Hey, that's a great idea. You fund that one, you fund the next one. Then one comes in that you actually think is better than the first two, but you're out of money because you funded those. That's what we were trying to avoid. And yeah. I think that's what our request was, so that if we could see, so that they weren't coming in throughout the year, but we can see and put them all out on the table and then choose which ones we wanted to fund. Because that's only fair for us, because um, when they do come in, some, some might be great ideas, but there's no more money or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to have a timeline for every year when that comes in or when that's due. 
Yeah, we can probably group those off-cycle ones just so it doesn't tell them, hey, it's not going to council before this time. So you do have that. Because that, that is always staff's fear, too, is you, these are great ideas, and then you, you fund it, and they get to the one that you, you think, wow, we really should have done that one. Then we have to go through a budget process, which you can do. But um, again, them by quarter. yeah, something. We can come up with something. So, so the council does have some money. Um, you've used it in the past uh, for, I'm trying to think of some groups we've funded um, with some sponsorships, but yeah, I think you bought one of the sponsorships when we were doing the basketball thing down here. Oh, yeah, so, th so there are a couple of things like that that were smaller. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, when I see this, that, that's where the Klamath film would fit really well. It's a festival. We know that um, it's something they're going to do. It'll bring in people. So uh, what, we'll, what I'll do um, is make sure I spell that out in, in your legislative budget so you know how much you have. And then we can re when you're doing it, we can take, take away from it and say, this is what we've taken away. Or that would be good. Does that sound good for everybody? Yeah. That's good. All righty. Thank you so much. It is now um, 7.02. So we will conclude. This, uh, there are no more questions. Thank you, Eric. Eric. Good morning. I um, just want to thank you for your proclamation and the community support of our work um, to keep kids in um, Klamath County and Klamath Falls and in Lake County safe. We um, have an amazing community and um, we have in the last five years reduced our foster care numbers from the 400s to 150 today. Wow. which is amazing work and it's um, work that child welfare and our self-sufficiency program does not do in isolation. We can only be successful as a community and um, that has really proven out in our ability to keep kids safe. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> it, it, go ahead. If you, can, if you can go ahead and, and push the button. And, um, and if you could tell us about the pinwheels, or go ahead and tell us. All right. So as you know, this is April, which is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, and nationally, we find ourselves, well, we put ourselves in solidarity with communities all over the nation by celebrating this month. Uh, and most specifically, we have the Day of Hope on April 1st. So I think many of you know that the last couple of years uh, we haven't been able to do our live event, although we did kind of a small one in front of the courthouse with community partners. But for safe distancing and all that, we decided not to do the, the large one, although we're hoping next year that we will. And then specifically, the pinwheel is the symbol, the national symbol of child abuse prevention around the nation. And again, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we put pinwheel gardens up around the community puts us again in solidarity with the rest of the nation. Now we're, I think we're kind of unique here because from what I understand, I know that this is true around the state, just talking to the other child advocacy centers around the state, that uh, nobody comes close to us in the number of pinwheel gardens that we put up. And so uh, we're proud of, of the community responding. Uh, this year we, we actually uh, we actually gave away over 5,000 pinwheels, and we did that uh, free of charge because we had been able to underwrite that last year. So we spread that, uh, you know, very sort of wealth around mm -hmm. <laughs> around the community because we know that everybody's hurting on some level. So we just decided to give them away. Uh, we didn't want to keep them, but we're very happy about that. Over 100 pinwheel gardens with um, within the school systems, uh, both public and private. Uh, city and county, uh, the uh, church, the faith community. There are a number of uh, th this year actually quite a few uh, faith communities that have jumped on board. Businesses, organizations, you probably can see a uh, somewhat abbreviated mm -hmm. pinwheel garden from compared to last year uh, out in front of the city hall. So they're all over the, the community, and we're very happy about that. Um, it's, it's less important that we're proud of that and more important that we're bringing awareness to this issue of child abuse prevention in our community, which historically was really tough. But as Marita was saying, we're getting somewhere. I really do believe we're getting somewhere. There's some good news and 
we just hope everybody keeps up the good work uh, with awareness, prevention, and especially reporting. Very good. And thank you both so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Mm -hmm. So we have another proclamation in honor of the 100th anniversary of the establishment. Oh, let's have Ipo come up and. Uh, And Ben Quinn, if you can come up right there, that would be great. So this is just wonderful. I'll read your proclamation and then I'll have you read that. Okay, so we have a proclamation in honor of the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Knights of Columbus within Klamath Falls, Oregon. Whereas the Knights of Columbus, an international Catholic organization, has approximately 1.9 million dedicated members working for the Catholic Church and their communities. Whereas in 1882, Father Michael J. McGibbon servant of God and the parish priest of St. Mary's Parish in New Haven, Connecticut, had a vision for the establishment of a, a fraternal benefit society that would provide aid to widows and their families after the death of their husband and or loss of their source of income. Whereas the Connecticut legislator issued a charter for Father McGiven on March 29, 1882 for the establishment of the Knights of Columbus as the, such a benefit, benefit society. Whereas the Klamath, uh, Knights of Columbus has founded on the firm principles of charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism to support the precepts of the Catholic faith through their works of the church, family, council, youth, and community. Whereas Mount McLaughlin Council 2255 has been providing service to the people of Klamath Falls, Oregon in the past hundred years, the Knights of Columbus are continuously performing corporal and spiritual works of mercy that extend God's compassion and mercy to those in need throughout the Klamath Falls community. And whereas the Knights of Columbus welcomes every practicing Catholic gentleman to join their ranks and participate in the improvement of their personal faith, local community, country, and the world whenever needed. So therefore, be it proclaimed by Kara Westfall, City of Klamath Falls Mayor, that April 24, 2021 is the official 100-year anniversary for the Mount McLaughlin Council to the City of Klamath Falls, Oregon. Mount McLaughlin's original charter date was April 24, 1921. In witness hereof, I have hereunto sent, set my hand on this fifth day of April, 2021, at Westfall Mayor for the City of Klamath Falls. And thank you so much. And go ahead and um, I'll hand this to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Mayor Westfall and council members, mm -hmm. uh, my name is Benjamin Quinn and this is Equal Ross, and we're both members of uh, Mount McLaughlin Council 2255 as is our city attorney. Uh, on behalf of Council 2255, we want to thank you for this distinct honor. Through the years, the city of Klamath, of Klamath Falls have been very supportive of the efforts of the Knights of Columbus. We hope that our efforts are being appreciated by the, by the citizens of uh, Klamath Falls. Now, at the end of the month, the council will be hosting the 113th Knights of Columbus State Convention. In attendance, there will be three other councils who are also celebrating 100 years this year, and uh, they will be acknowledged for their uh, accomplishment. Now this year's convention motto is Mercy in Motion. This arises from the fact that Knights of Columbus are continuously performing corporal and spiritual works of mercy that extends God compassion and mercy to all those in need. Now during the annual convention, the Knights typically will do a service project in the host city. Now one of the corporal works of mercy is Bury the Dead, and that will be this year's project. Epo and I also represent Mount Calvary Catholic Cemetery. I as the president and Epo as our cemetery manager. On November 18, 2017, we dedicated a portion of the cemetery as a potter's field to provide a final resting place for less fortunate. It was a community-wide event that we interred 148 sets of cremains with the assistance of the Knights of Columbus. These were previously abandoned and unclaimed, our very own Mayor Caramont Westfall was in attendance. This event captured media attention here at home, around the nation, and we also got comments from Europe. Now on Sunday, May 2nd, which is the final day of our convention, Knights and their wives will be going to Mount Calvary to assist as we bury another 150 sets of unclaimed and abandoned cremains in our potter's field. Our very own Bishop Liam Carey, who is the Bishop of Diocese Baker, will preside over a short graveside service. 
In addition, we will have military honors because a handful of these were veterans. We would like to extend an invitation to the community, as well as yourselves, to join us in this corporal work of mercy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And can I, can I go ahead and take your statement? Or, yeah, sure. And then just attach. Is, it, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Don't, don't I appreciate it. Typos. No worries. <laughs> I won't look for them, okay? okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Okay, yes. So we have a, um, I just wanted to really make sure that we reached out and congratulated you on 18 years of uh, being a, I'll just read it, the city is celebrating the 18th year as a tree city. This accomplishment is rightly due to the overall support of city staff, council, and mayors who have appreciated the intrinsic value that the urban forests provide to the community. The city offers individual consulting service, training, and use of local contractors along with the investment of systemic care of trees living within the downtown and city right of ways. Many of the city's practices now go beyond those of other recognized city tree cities, whereby our focus is education, educating citizens one by one and shouldering the duty of care for public trees. By the way of the, by way of individual services the city provides, we are a public sector caretakers. As uh, public city caretakers are building a growing sense of appreciation and camaraderie with our community and citizens. And I really want to thank you for all of your efforts. We have the flag that we will be putting up for 18 years of service. Thank you. And here's your box. You have to open that one up. It's neat. Open it up. You should open oh, no, the flag. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's open up the flag. It's going to go in the back. And we'll put that up. In the Where is it going? On the wall. In the back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's neat. Nice and bright. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> And John, I wanted to award you with this because there's only one other little insect that's as prolific as you are, and that is this uh, Mason Tower Bee House. Bee house. Oh, great. And this little bee, it's called the Mason Bee, are solitary native bees, which are the most prolific pollinators on our planet. Mason bees are not aggressive like honeybees because they do not have a queen or make honey. Instead, each female Mason Bee has one job in her life, to lay as many eggs as possible. And you, sir, have planted so many trees in our city that I thought this was fitting. So here you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, John. John, did you want to say anything? Additionally? <laughs> so I'm sorry what you read was a little hard to read. That's just how I write. But anyway, I wanted to explain that, you know, when I think of the city organization, I, I sort of think of a tree where there's so many parts, you know, to that tree that have all these functions. And without any one of those, the tree fails. And I'm just so proud of all of you for the support, you know, that I have received. But all of the promise that together, you know, we're going to accomplish in the future. So, thank you. Very good. Okay. We will now go into public comment. Anybody wishing to speak on anything that is not on the agenda can come up to the podium. We'll give you three minutes. Anybody online? I don't see anybody raising their hand online. Okay, seeing and hearing nobody, we will close that. And on to the um, consent agenda. Approval of consent agenda 
Uh, 5.1, the approval of consent agenda is, uh, oh, 5.2, the approval of the annual audit reports for the City of Klamath Falls and the Klamath Falls Urban Renewal Agency for the fiscal year ending in June 30th, 2020, and 5.3, March 2021, wastewater treatment plant project update. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. All righty. So where am I? Okay. Number six. Number six. Uh, general public hearing. An ordinance amending section 6.785 courtesy permits and 7.187 permits. First reading. And Aaron Snow. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Well, um, so if you're visiting downtown, um, you're most likely going to be able to park for up to two hours. Um, if you have an employee permit because you work in downtown, you can park all day, which is great. However, if uh, you're like my, my grandmother who wants to visit her only great grandson and during his nap time shop in downtown for three, maybe four hours, you can get a courtesy customer parking permit. Allows you to park anywhere for up to four hours, which is great. However, fun fact for you guys, I am the municipal court supervisor, and the staff that I have, they're, they're the boots on the ground. These permits are hardly ever used. Hardly anybody knows about them. And uh, well, we wanted to do something about that. So attached to this report was a policy that the parking committee actually drafted to try to monitor and make these things more well known so that people will use them and get fewer parking tickets so it's a better experience in downtown. We historically have been giving these courtesy permits away for free and when we were about to pass the policy, we ran into some issues with city code. Courtesy permits are mentioned in three places in two sections and they each say different things. One of them that we have been looking at says that we can give them away for free, which is what we've been doing for years. Another spot says that we need to charge businesses for them. And it's just kind of references, well, we need to charge them, and that's probably something that would be in the city manager fee schedule. Another spot in city code says that we are supposed to charge specifically 30 bucks per quarter each permit. And so, ugh. and anecdotally, that hasn't happened in over 15 years. Since then, we would charge a buck per, and then it came to a point where nobody was using them. So we were scanning them and saying, please just use them, and it just wasn't working. We ran into this code, and we realized, well, technically, according to two separate places, we could be charging for these, but we haven't been. We've been giving away for free. And, well, we've been giving away for free for years. And so passing this policy depends on us cleaning up code. And that's why I'm here is because this ordinance, we have decided to take out anything that mentions charging businesses. We have decided to keep letting these be free of charge. It clarifies that city staff, the city manager, and their designee can distribute these to necessary parties, and this will clean up city code. And that is that. This is a good step in the direction of, hey, the city loves the downtown. Let's make this happen. That's it. If you have any other questions, let me know. Sometimes cities have like, um, where the merchants, if you show them a tag, like um, it'll validate your parking. You know, if you spend money downtown, um, I think it's a good idea. But could that be something that you use to make sure people are purchasing things downtown? I mean, I guess it's not an issue of money. You, you don't worry about that. You just want to give it away. I, I'm not really sure what. Well, there are a few places in downtown that just the nature of the business requires somebody to be there for more than two hours, like tattoo parlors or hair salons if you're doing yeah. something fancy. Yeah. So this is just an opportunity for them to not have to worry about moving their car okay. or parking somewhere else. Okay. But can, can also dip into that pool a little bit as well. You, you bring up some good points. All right. Anybody else? Fancy hair. 
Fancy hair, yes. <laughs> My hair? Yeah. I think you need a courtesy for it. So I, I, Go ahead. I just have a, I have a comment, basically. So I know that those were used at law firms I've worked at in my own law firm because sometimes you have you know, trials or you have different things like that. So they are being utilized. Um, but my, I think this will help clear that up a little bit because I thought those were for all day. So I would have told my clients, sure, you're great all day. And I don't know if it says, I think they were just like a little yellow piece of paper, correct, that you had on a packet. Some were. Yeah. Some were. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, I definitely support clearing this up, but also getting that information out to the, the downtown businesses on what they actually are for. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, good job. Thank you for working on that. That's important. Public hearing. Thank you, Joe. Oh, public hearing. Mm -hmm. We'll open it up for a public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak on this matter can come up and speak. Seeing and hearing nobody, we'll close that out. I would move to uh, approve the ordinance as presented for the first reading by title only. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Uh, please read the ordinance by title. An ordinance amending section 6.78. Five courtesy permits and 7.187 <coughs> permits. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 7.1, the approval of the airport master plan. Airport director, John Barsley, reporting. Hey, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, <clears throat> as you know, we've been working on the master plan for a little over two years. Um, we've gone through a, a variety of sections uh, with you. Um, I didn't want to attach the whole document. It's well over several hundred pages. So I attached the executive summary, but put a link to the whole document. If you wanted to see the whole document, you could. Um, we had an open house, a public meeting, uh, virtual. One of the first, that I think it was the FAA did. Um, we did have a few comments, and we responded to those comments at, at that time. <coughs> So Nathan, if you could pull up the um, the slides that I have there. So this is a very large document, obviously. So I don't want to go through all of it. I thought I would just kind of hit some of the highlights, and then that you ask questions if you have any questions. This is a typically a, a you know 20-year plan, um, and its uh, last one was done in 2005. So here's so here's a drawing. <coughs> One of the drawings that uh, I'll go through four or five of these in the next 20 year plan. So this is the next uh, five years. Uh, you'll see up in the upper left hand corner there, five year CIP. And we recently received a letter from the FAA kind of confirming this. And so our project is to reconstruct runway 725 as our first project in this uh, um, next up in the evolution of uh, development at the airport. Um, that runway is in need of repair, and it's not just a rehab. We can't just kind of overlay, you know, cut up top, top inches and overlay it. We need to re really reconstruct it. So it's a little bit over a $10 million project, and you'll hear about that in the next item that I have on the agenda. <coughs> taxiway Foxtrot, which is the, is the taxiway next to it, is the next project within that. Oh, no, oh, you're, you're okay. Right there, yep. And that's the next, uh, you know, in that five years, and that's a. I think it's a six or seven million dollar project. Um, so one of the things that the master plan also does, you see the item number three there on that drawing, the master plan incorporates the um, Air National Guard, so their, their development plan as well. So I wanted to just uh, let you know that. And so this piece where it says number three there is we're planning on uh, you know, working through the FAA and with the Guard to actually expand or widen that portion of the taxiway to 75 feet, and the northern or the uh, uh, eastern portion, the portion that's on the upper side of that page there, is actually shrinking from 50 feet to 35 feet in accordance with FAA standards. <coughs> okay, next one. Mm -hmm. So then you got the six to 10 years uh, cycle, the next CIP plan. So the, the previous one, you know, almost $20 million um, kind of identified in the previous slide. 
Um, in this slide, um, so we have, so it shows the runway and you know, taxiway foxtrot, but you add golf and because uh, the taxiway echo, because of the design standards that the FAA has, we have to modify that. Um, you see in the north EOR there, if you would bring your cursor over, thank you Nathan, over in the six and eight there, that has to be modified. Uh, that doesn't meet FAA current standards and so that whole area has to be modified and this is also incorporating the guards installation development plan as well. Next one. So then this shows even further out your 10 to, uh, let's see, what does this go back down? Just a little bit, Nathan. There you go, 11, 15 years. So development on the east side, if there is demand, that's what this shows, this is where that demand would go. Um, we've actually received information from uh, an interested party that wants to develop on the east side one of those hangars. So this isn't necessarily, you know, on, as far as the exact time goes, this could be as the demand appears. And then the next slide is the last five to, to 20 years. The ultimate plan shows even further development on the west side, uh, again, demand driven. And so some of the other uh, projects that we previously showed, it also includes, this, this slide also includes some of the guards development over the next 10 to 15 years or so. And the orange pieces there. Are there questions that I cover everything? I guess while you're look, thinking about that, I did want to say thank you to John Downer as well. Uh, John has helped me at the airport, not only the city parks, but he does help out at the airport. We have an obstruction removal project that's going on right now that uh, John and Linda are working on. It's a kind of a, a super deal, take care of some trees that are growing outside of the airport's boundaries that, that John is helping with. We're replanting some trees as well so that we don't have this problem in the future. Um, also, I have on the phone um, Miranda Thompson, or on the computer here, um, and if you have any questions that I can answer, um, certainly I can ask her to step in, but she has been super instrumental in, in making this happen and putting this all this plan together. It's not a simple thing, getting FAA approval. Yeah. Councilman um, Anders. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I had just a couple uh, quick questions. Uh, if I remember reading correctly, it's going from 100 feet wide down to 75. That is correct. Does that box us in? Does that provide, does that make us not able to service any type of planes? No, no, most of the planes that we have can service, so even the FBO's um, operations, their planes, the, even if we were to bring in the, the CRJ, if we were to get air service back, they could still use the narrower runway, the short, and it's going to shorten down to 5,000 feet, right? To 75 by set by 5,000. So that there's no real concern of, not at this point. Okay. Um, and also the number changes from 725 to 826. So you'll hear me talk about that. All right. So. Uh, a few years back, yep. Uh, the Air Force did, a, or the uh, National Guard did a study regarding the height around the airport, and does it. Would the, that, any of that be encompassed into this your master plan here for what their their needs are? I know most of that's outside of the uh, airport proper. So I, as I, if I'm, I'm understanding you correctly, I think most of that has to do with the JLUS project that yes. we're working on, right? So we have a phase two JLUS project that uh, Joe Wall and I are working on, and uh, Joe will be bringing up some things to you, to talking about that in the future. So. One of the projects that you see here on this slide, or at least it should indicate that the ILS for runway 14, the instrument landing system, is being planned by the guard right now, and that will have some impact or some play with that because it requires us to go out further with our um, services with, a, with an instrument landing system. Okay. And so there will be some impact with that, but the master plan itself doesn't focus on, it focuses on airport development uh, majority. Third, you, you mentioned uh, in the beginning the, uh, public comment, and there was some comments. Any concerns there that we should know about? Not that I'm a, not that I'm aware of. There was a, um, most of the comments were from the the impact. We did have uh, many members of the community, the uh, master plan <coughs> action committee or you know, planning committee, and they helped us the impact go through. Um, all of these chapters, these various chapters that we went through, 
And the, the question that we, the only question that we received was from one of the existing West Side um, port of ports, and they were concerned that we were just forcing them out. And the, the plan just kind of shows some development in that area and some future uh, for the port of ports to move to the east side, but there's no set timeline. And that was the concern is that we thought that once this got approved, that immediately they had to move. And that's not the case, at least not from my perspective. So, so we're working with that concern. Yeah, I mean that's gonna that's gonna be that's something that's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, you know, and how and how that plays out. Currently, don't have a, a, a need for that right at this moment, but that could change at any time. So that's the part we don't know. All right, thank you. Sure. Questions. <clears throat> just trying to. Think of other things. There's so many things in this document. It's just taking us so long to get through that it's hard to. I'm just trying to hit the highlights and not spend a ton of time. Do you need the book? The pages. But that, yeah, there's the book. The book. If you want, if you want to see in paper copy, uh, Nicole has a, a bound wow. copy over there, and uh, we we do already have FAA approval. Uh, we were trying to decide do we come to City Council first, we go to FAA first, and we went back and forth for a while and just decided let's get FAA approval. And for some reason, there was some major change that we would have to go back to the FAA, we would, but we thought this would be the best way to go. I would move to approve the airport master plan. And say good job, John. Yeah, second. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All, very good. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. On to 7.2, airport grant application for FAA airport improvement project to reconstruct runway 7 slash 25 and runway lighting. Phase one design and John Barsley. Thank you. And I just want to thank you and thank Miranda and the impact members and our, my staff as well for all the help they did on the master plan. That's just a, a monumental effort. So good job. Thank you. This picture work for you for this? Yes, this picture works great. So, so this next item is uh, runway 725 it's a reconstruct that i was just talking about so this is actually a uh, about a 10 million dollar project give or take um, and it's uh, reconstructing the that whole runway that full length and uh, I, as, we, as you said earlier it's narrowing it from from 100 feet to 75 feet and shrinking it from 52 80 i think down to 5,000 feet um, to get rid of the what they call displaced thresholds at either end, the FAA says no more thr displaced thresholds, and so we therefore then have to adjust the taxiways at each end in order to meet the new ends of the taxiways. That brings the, the runway in a little bit shorter, and that means then the space that we're talking about with the JLS project and the potential tree obstruction stuff like that on either ends aren't aren't as dramatic as they were with it just like it is. So that helps. Um, and so this is actually just phase one. So in our FAA budgeting, we have $150,000 annually in what they call entitlement dollars. And this, and this project or this grant that we're going af after here is for that $150,000. In subsequent years, the FAA has said without any particular guarantee that the next grant then would be for the full the remainder amount of the remainder of the design and the full construction effort um, that we will go through for that that project. So you'll see me come back again, but this grant here is just for the first start, of the you know, beginning of we have to start planning and designing that effort. Questions? Councilman Dodson? And I could be getting wires crossed or maybe it doesn't factor anymore. I thought this runway needed to be longer to support the mission for the guard, potentially, a potential mission. I, yes, if it were, but the guard doesn't use this one and based on the constraints of the mountains on both sides and the school and the Henley High School, there's there's really not a this way to not, extend that's not it. Feasible. So we'll, we'll we've, look, we've looked into it, it just isn't feasible, so we're tacking in a different direction. Correct, do you want to talk about your, it, it's in the master plan. Right? It is right. in the master plan, yeah, I can talk about that. So one of the things by incorporating the, the guards installation development plan was, we did, we talked about that very issue, we were concerned about that runway, and so one of the things we did in the master plan that the FAA um, really, we really couldn't get approval from the FAA on because just a, for a variety of reasons, and we can go into a lot of detail over that, but we did put into the plan 
future, basically a future parallel runway to help accomplish a second runway if needed by the guard. And so one of the things we wanted to do was actually show on a drawing parallel to, to eight four, or no, 1432. 1432, okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you look in the plan, there is a, um, a, a concept, a very, very, very conceptual design of a, a potential parallel runway and how far it is from the existing 1432 in order to accommodate a second runway for the guard if a second runway is needed. And so that's always been in the guard's plan was, was putting um, barriers on 725 so they could use that runway. And after many months of conversation and actually a couple of years of conversation with the guard, uh, trying to figure out can they use that crosswind runway for their mission, the answer always came back no. It would have to be 9,000 feet at minimum in order to get to 9,000 feet. As Nathan mentioned, you got mountains on either side, you got obstructions and you know airspace issues that there's no way that that runway could be extended uh, to that length to make it workable for the guard aircraft. So therefore we went to, we kind of abandoned that whole idea of extending the 725 runway and went into the parallel runway discussion and that's what's in the chapters uh, you know, buried in the uh, in the master plan. Not on purpose, that's just the way that plays out. If you're interested, I can and I can show you where that is. In the no, it's, it was just I remember that it's discussion. No, 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 yeah. I remember the parallel runways. Right, like we were gonna when we redid the taxiway, right? Like that was like a predecessor. Well, yeah, there was, I think in the previous master plan, there showed there was a parallel taxiway. Of this run of the of 725 on the south side, which would be on the right side in this drawing. Right. Um, there was that was showing in the previous master plan, but after discussing okay. it and going through it, we decided that infrastructure wasn't necessary in order to maintain the purpose of this of this run of this crosswind. Okay. So in many airports across the country, the FAA is actually not allowing crosswind runways because they're not justified. In our situation, our runway is because of our winds. And so then what was it justified to? Then it becomes an aircraft uh, discussion. And you know what size aircraft can meet that? And that's where you end up in this, the, the answer to your question. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Okay. Any more questions, comments? <coughs> I'll move to authorize staff to submit a grant application to the FAA in the amount of $150,000 to reconstruct runway 7- and runway lighting phase one design and allow acceptance of the grant if offered. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And just one last thing on that. So the, one of our inspections, we had to replace some of the lights on the on 1432 as part of this project as well. So you'll hear, you might hear some about lighting on runway 14 and you'd be asking why, but it is part of this project because of a, a previous inspection that we had. Okay. Mary, can, can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. I'm not sure if John will leave. Uh -huh. um, just because we had two things related to the airport, uh -huh. um, I hope that we as council, uh, yeah, if uh, the future of uh, funding from the federal government keeps going the path it is, that we encourage our state and federal lawmakers to start the EIS program, the Essential Air Service. Yeah, EAS program. Yeah, excuse yeah. me, as yeah. I spoke out there. EAS program. Um, it feels like something, right, that a lot of parts of the country could benefit from. Specifically, it really looks like we would need that program in order to get air service back. And I would say this is probably the best window we've had in years. <laughs> to the, the, There's money out there now, right? And they're kind of not exactly knowing where to spend it. So I feel like we really need to start advocating and getting lots of advocates for that program to at least get back to where it was, if not expand. Yeah. Good, if I, good idea. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I if I may, Nathan. Um, yes. There was a, a call this morning just to, in discussing that very thing, and there's a draft letter that I'm preparing for probably Nathan's signature to send on up to our congressional delegation, and we've got to meet with them to talk to them about how the best way to accomplish that is. But to go after that EAS, that's one of the things Nathan and I have actually talked about in the last couple of weeks about moving that forward. So, very good, good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. And if you need signatures from us, yeah. um, okay. let us know. Yeah, we'll good. do. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Well.
7.3, Fund Exchange Program Master Agreement Number 34753 <coughs> with the Oregon Department of Transportation, ODOT, and Public Works Director Mark Wilbrecht report. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this uh, master agreement we have before you tonight is uh, between us and the Oregon Department of Transportation. It essentially allows us to more easily access our uh, uh, block grant funds. Um, which at one point in time were called service transportation program funds not so many years ago. And those S STP funds, um, we use them for transportation projects. That's all they can be used for. We've come in the past before council um, with individual project intergovernmental agreements. And what we usually do is come back with a, maybe it be a chip seal or some other project. We know what the project was, total cost, request the IGA with ODOT, and then we bring that before you for approval. Um, then a couple of years ago, they changed the rules to where we actually had to have the IG in place before we could spend any money on a project, which made it very difficult since we didn't know what the whole project cost was going to be. And then now, just recently, um, they put together this master agreement file, which essentially we allows us to withdraw the funds after it's signed off on, we can get them right away and put them on our own account. Uh, the biggest difference um, between the, S the service uh, transportation block grant and the STP funds from the old exchange rate was 94 cents on the dollar, and that's good for all the funds we have now in the bank. Starting next year, that exchange rate will change to 90 cents on the dollar. So, with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Councilman Andrews. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I figured as much. <laughs> um, I get it. Reading this, uh, you wrote a very good explanation. So, um, I mean, it's costing us 10 cents on, on the dollar. What do they? What do we get for that ten cents out of the dollar? Because I, I mean, I get the flexibility of the money. I get that. But I mean, what is the state or ODOT doing? Are they just writing a deposit slip? And yeah, yeah, the details of ODOT's funding obviously I'm not qualified to talk about. But what they do is they take those funds and they can they can administer those federal funds. It's um, going to be obviously much more complex to deal with. I I tried to I had a feeling this was going to come up, so I tried to do tried to do some research on this. So. I actually called uh, the city of Corvallis, um, and I just happened to ask them, you know, what do you, because they administer some federal projects, and I, I mentioned them about this you know, exchange rate, and they said, oh yeah, they, they'll take the exchange rate because you're going to spend a lot more than 10 cents on the dollar trying to administer this as a federal project, because that's the whole thing. If you take that as federal funds, you have to administer it as a federal project. NEPA and all the other requirements you're going to wind up having to go through. I, I, and I get that, but... So it's going to be additional cost. That's what we get out of it. It's not just the flexibility of the money, but also what it's going to be the cost of it, those other programs. So I guess we could take it. And, and the things I tried to ask is what happens if we keep those as federal dollars? And the interesting part is that the program coordinator for the STBG didn't know. So she referred me to our area uh, liaison with ODOT. He didn't know. So he referred me to one of the federal, I don't know what they did, one of the other programs. He couldn't answer my question. Uh, what, the, what the coordinator with ODOT, the, S, the SDBG coordinator, did tell me is that every agency who gets these funds, the STP or now these, these exchanges them for state dollars. City manager. It's, if I might, I think one of the, what the, what the state would argue probably is they're taking your 10 cents because they are now going to go administer those federal funds and it's much more labor intensive. They're giving us state monies which are easier to deal with. I'm assuming that's why they have to the exchange rate, and I don't know if it's gone up, um, you know, 67%, so they went from six cents to That's 10 it. cents. Yeah. But um, <laughs> maybe it has. I, having uh, done some federal projects where we were, where we as the city were required to do NEPA, uh, the, the amount of time and the consultants we paid uh, looking in hindsight, I'd have paid ten cents on the dollar to get, to get out of it. But I think that's probably what their their argument is. They're taking on the challenge and the risk, and so they're giving us less money so they can fund it. And they're probably also funding staff with it. Yeah. All good. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Any more questions, comments? I didn't, I didn't understand as well as thought. So you're saying we don't have to do the IDAs anymore, that the, the state can distribute its funds when we complete a project? 
actually even before that. So when, once this is signed and everybody signed off on it, the money we have in the bank, which is roughly 2.1 million, we could actually request that money, put it in our own cot in our own account, and we just have to be accountable for make sure we can explain what we spend it on. Okay. So we're giving up six cents to make things a whole lot easier. Ten. Ten. Well, we've already given up four before. So we were giving up six before, and now we're giving You'll be on your future fund. So the money that's out there right now, the money that, that yeah. we have on account. But it's going to be a much easier process for our staff to Yeah, there's work no more, project. every time we have to do a project, there's no individual IGAs. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we, we should say that's what it will start out with. I don't know <laughs> what will happen. <laughs> with these funds because I think the 90 when we used to do it for 94 cents it actually used to be quite simple as it, well it wasn't as bad just a little more time not bad um, it's, it gets a little bit more complex each time and we, we do this with uh, our um, congestion CMAC oh, funds as well and, there, and there's an exchange there again some federal fund that have federal ties to them very difficult to use um, so it's it's money they give us but they do constrain us quite a bit on how we use it. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to authorize the city manager to execute agreement number 34753 with the Oregon Department of Transportation. Second. Um, yeah. Point of clarification, yeah. is it the mayor? It's the mayor. It's, it's the mayor. It's supposed to be the mayor. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Um, and Phil seconded? Yes. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, and any opposed? Very good. Thank you, Mark. Um, 7.4, construction service contract with diversified <coughs> contractors incorporated for the outdoor pavilion project at the Yellow Red Key Pool in the amount $95,098 plus contingency allowance. And we have development service director Scott Savage. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so we have in front of you a, a project that uh, the Friends of El Reiki and El Reiki Pool staff have been working on since about September of 2019. I'm not, I'm not sure if we have an image of it or not. If you'll pull up. But effectively what uh, Brielle and that team over at the pool are looking at doing. Yeah. So if, if you could scroll down just a little bit, I can explain through sort of what we're doing here. So if you can orient yourself, that big circle in the middle is the abandoned waiting pool that's been abandoned for years, as long as I can remember. And she's been looking for opportunities and the, and the Friends of El uh, in partnership with, with uh, Pool Supervisor Brielle George, have been looking at opportunities to utilize that space and engage that space for pool activities as they look to expand programs. And the idea that they came up with a couple of years ago was to provide an uh, outdoor pavilion in that space that could be used for you know, birthday parties, social gatherings, but as well as training opportunities and other program opportunities for, say, yoga class or something like that. So when they started looking into this, we put it into the CIP, and the city allocated, I think, $15,000 towards seed money for grant match dollars. So over the course of the last year or so, uh, following that time, they were able to pull together about $62,000 or so. We put together a project that was 30 foot by 36 foot, open air pavilion, basically a, a glorified pole barn, if you will, with nice trim finishes. We put the project out, we solicited for quotes because we thought the project would come in somewhere between 50 and $70,000, figuring about 60, $65 a square foot for something like that. We received bids in January ranging between $109,000 and $194,000, which is crazy. So we all hit the floor and said this project's dead. But Brielle didn't, and Friends of El Redke didn't, and they kept pushing to try to come up with different creative solutions. And they worked for, for quite some time trying to come up with different ways to do this, exploring kit projects, exploring how could they get more money, exploring volunteer-based stuff. So they looked at a bunch of different things. While doing that, we also worked together with the low bidders, diversified contractors, and tried to come up with some opportunities to value engineer the project. Where we finally ended up was, with the help of Friends of El Reiki, they were able to go secure additional 
funding. Um, there's a recap right there on the screen of, of what they've been able to find. I think in all they were able to come up with a little over $40,000 in additional fund funding. Of that, $25,000 is in the pool allocation for budget for this year for the pool slide replacement project. That slide replacement project for a variety of reasons has not moved forward. One, they've been focusing efforts on trying to secure dollars for this because this pool slide replacement project also requires grant dollars. So the, the question on the table tonight for you all is would you be willing to re allow the reallocation of that $25,000 to this project and authorize a value engineered project. Originally we were starting at 30 by 36. We value engineered that down to 30 by 30. We provided some opportunities for our parks crews to do some of the landscaping work, um, grading around the project, which got the project down to 95,000, I'm gonna be specific here, $95,098. And then I was asking for an additional $9,500 in contingency allowance should, should unforeseen issues come up during the course of construction. So with that being said, before we, my ultimate ask is for you to authorize city manager to execute a contract with Diversified <coughs> for that 95,098 and additionally, an additional $9,500 in contingency. No, so with that, do we have any questions? Question. Yeah. Go ahead, Councilman. It, it, it's a question more and more of a comment that I'm about to make. Um, so out of the 95,000 though, the city's really only bringing in 40 of that, right? Correct. Okay, I just wanna make sure I got that in my head. Correct. Um, so a comment, okay? Um, I was extremely proud to read this tonight. I'm what? proud. And let me explain why. Because, because as I read my report, you know, I saw that you know, the concept was this, cost got overrun, and um, so often what happens is the group still comes in front of city council and says, hey, we just need an extra, you know, it's 40, now we really need 65. And you can go out and find the money. And what I saw was a group of volunteers and friends understand what the problem was and they tried to solve it before they even came in front of us. And I thought that was special and I would tell you that um, that's the spirit, and I see a few of them out here right now, and uh, so I'm speaking, you know, through you to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's that. Uh, too often, the first explanation I just said it happens, and I really, truly appreciated um, what your efforts were, and quite honestly, even with those efforts, and they didn't res result what they did, I would have been in favor of this just because of the effort because of the spirit that they were really trying to, to uh, find solutions to problems. And so I want, as an elected official here, thank you for doing an outstanding job and caring about the money that we have to make choices on. And um, I'll just leave it there, okay? But thank you. Yeah, well said, and I, and I want to echo that. I, I will tell you mm -hmm. that I, I got to the point where I thought it was a lost cause just because it was such a high dollar. And, yeah. and the, the, the group of three, that are in the audience right here, Brielle George and, and Mike Reeder and, and Nancy Thomas with Friends of El Arecchi Pool, they literally did not give up. And so we've spent numerous hours trying to come up with this. And unfortunate, we're in, we're in tough times right now. As we see in all of our projects with these construction bid numbers, it's, it's impossible to estimate. I, you never would have convinced me that we were gonna pay over 70 bucks a square foot, say, for an open air pavilion. And, and we did everything we could with DCI and we're pushing on our dollars a square foot. So, and that's being very creative. But yeah, yeah, thank you for those words. I think that's very much appreciated by everyone. As far as the circular um, little splash pad that you're mm -hmm. not using anymore, was there any consideration of maybe doing a pavilion around that circle? Yes, in fact, that was the original concept. Mm -hmm. But we intentionally moved it over to where it is. It's 12 feet off the fence in those two areas so we can maintain that space. Uh -huh. And then that provides additional open space. So that whole area where the circle is, that's all being demoed as part of this. Mm -hmm. And we're putting topsoil back in there and we're gonna reseed it to lawn. So that whole area will be able to be engaged for other activities um, with, with lawn space in that. 
Additionally, we're looking at expanding the concrete plaza space where those three tables are to provide some additional hardscape areas for more programs. And then we have another project in the next biennial to remove the chain link fence or the big chain link fence between that upper pool deck and that lower space. We have a project that we're putting together with friends help and, and, and chasing dollar numbers to open that all up and engage those two spaces together so you can offer more uh, recreational opportunities, training opportunities, things like that. So there's a long-term vision that we're kind of slowly moving towards there. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. It's going to be great. Any other comments, questions? Okay. I would move to authorize the city manager to execute a construction services contract with diversified contractors in the not to exceed amount of $95,098 plus authorize an additional contingency allowance of $9,500. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Very good. Thank you. 10.5, construction service contract with Bob's Excavating Incorporated for the Manzanita Street and Earl Street sewer replacement project in the not to exceed amount of 322446 plus contingency allowances. And we have Scott Satters again. Thank you. So now we talk, talk uh, wastewater. This is another one of our um, uh, sections of sewer replacement projects that we do throughout the city. This is, we packaged two projects together, Manzanita Street and Earl Street. Uh, the one in front of you, I believe, is Earl Street. Um, Earl Street is roughly 680 feet of six inch clay pipe, uh, five manholes and 12 services. Um, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, which is a terrible image, but uh, that's Manzanita Street, it's 200 feet. So about 880 feet of pipe replacement, uh, eight manholes and 16 services with this project. Um, this project was uh, put out for bid in March. Uh, bids received on March 18th. Bob's Excavating was the only bidder for this project at $322,400. $46. Uh, we anticipate a total project including 15% contingency to equal $428,711. This project, because it splits fiscal years, we used to do this a lot when we had annual budgets and now that we have biannual budgets, we're still doing it when we need to. So it's been a long a while since I've had this conversation with you. But we designed this project in the current fiscal year with anticipation to construct it this summer, but in the next fiscal year, so uh, contract award in July. We bring this before you right now in anticipation of approval of next fiscal biennial budget, once it's, if and when it's approved, at that point, tonight you would authorize the city manager to execute the contract as long as all the numbers hold as presented to you in the budget. That will allow us to hit this construction season this year uh, beginning construction properly in July. Um, with that, is there any questions? to authorize the city manager to execute a construction services contract with Bob's Excavating Inc. for the Manzanita and Earl Street sewer replacement project in the not to exceed amount of $322,446 plus authorize an additional 15% contingency allowance of $48,367 upon adoption of the fiscal biennial 2021-2023 budget. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All righty. Thank you very much. 7.6, a resolution updating the public contracting regulations for the City of Plymouth Falls pertaining to contracts up to 10,000 and amend City Council Policy CP-020-001 and City Attorney Michael Swanson reporting. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, Council. This is really just a housekeeping thing, as often happens with my role. I was researching a project, and I came across this uh, little statute in our um, in the state statutes, 279B065, that uh, talks about small procurements going up to $10,000. And I knew that in our 
uh, policy, they were only up to 5,000, and so um, part of my duties are to make sure that I renew or I review our procurement policies, and I'm bringing this before you to have our policy conform with the state law. Um, there's no penalty for only having up to $5,000 for our small procurements, but it does seem to be a lot more expedient uh, to allow small procurements within the city of Klamath Falls up to 10,000. And what that basically means is that uh, the, uh, the managers, the directors would have the ability to um, award these smaller procurements in any manner that makes the most sense so we can be a little bit more efficient. So that's really what the goal is, is to become more efficient with everyone's time and money. And you'll be seeing more things like this as I continue to go through the uh, amended Oregon revised statutes and compare them to what our policies are because our policies are based upon the state statutes and they do little tweaks every so often that we need to catch up to. So this is just the first of many that I anticipate. Okay. Questions, comments? I'll move to introduce and read resolution by title only. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? City Manager, please read the resolution by title. A resolution updating the public contracting regulations for the City of Klamath Falls pertaining to contracts up to 10,000 and amend City Council Policy CP-02-001. Move to approve the resolution. Second. Roll call, please. Councilor Stuenberg? Yes. Councilor Dodson? Yes. Councilor Blaine? Yes. Councilor Andres? Yes. 7.7, 7, a resolution adopting a supplemental budget for the biennial budget period 2019-2021 within the general fund and escrow reserve fund. And Finance Director Jessica Lindsay reported. Evening, Mayor and Council. Yeah, just a small little supplemental. Um, we need a 7,700 um, increase in legislative division for insurance changes that will come out of our reserves. Um, back this fall, um, Council approved a $10,000 um, grant match for the OIT for higher stadium improvements. This is just doing the budget side to transfer the funds from the escrow to the general fund so we can pay that out. Do you have any questions? Questions, comments? I'll move to introduce the resolution and read by title only. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? City Manager, please read the resolution by title. A resolution adopting, adopting a supplemental budget for the biennial budget period 2019 through 2021 within the general fund and escrow reserve fund. Move to approve the resolution. Roll call, please. I need a second. Oh, second. Second. And roll call, please. Um, Councilor Thunberg? Yes. Councilor Dodson? Yes. Councilor Blaine? Yes. Councilor Arnold? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, other matters. Just want to say that the, um, the new little conference room is coming right along. We've got some new artwork in there, and you'll see that we've got a new uh, logo. We've had Nicole and Angie um, real instrumental in helping with the decorating, so uh, congratulate them. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Anybody else with anything else? Um, we will adjourn into an executive session, 192.6602G, trade negotiations. I would move to adjourn into the executive session. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you.